We've been talking about uh, a series over the last um, month about flipping the script, and part of that is just, you know, we hear things and we believe them to be true, and then they're not true, but we uh, believe them so much to be true that it affects our life, it affects the way we think, the way we do things, and we know that the enemy wants to uh, continue to give us uh, false information, and then we know the Word of God if we read the script. Amen. <laughs> Grab, grab your uh, script, if you will, and make sure you have it open or on, if you have it on your cell phone or your Bible. I don't, I have a cell phone app where I, um, I like to read, or leave it, leave it, play it, and, and auto, and auto so I can read, hear it. That's really nice, but there's just something about grabbing a book. Yeah. Maybe I'm old fashioned, and uh, how many, how many scholars we got here that have textbooks? They, they didn't even sell textbooks anymore in college. Yeah. Or you get it all on an iPad or your phone, you know. But I just said something about reading the book, getting, getting, um, uh, and reading it and just uh, having it in my hands. Uh, we want to, uh, we need to uh, flip the script in the truth of what God's telling us over what the enemy is telling us. Amen. And we got to change because sometimes we believe things that are not really true. Um, And the enemy just keeps on throwing these things at us, and pretty soon we hear so much we begin to believe it. And we just want to, when, when, a, when a believer is impacted by untruths, it impacts everything in our life. It impacts the way our attitude is, right? It impacts our emotions when we start to believe untrue things. It determines our behavior because we act a certain way because of this untruth we believe for a long time or it also regulates our relationships how we deal with people around us and it also ultimately decides our future um, let's talk about what Aunt, pastor andrew talked shared last week remember his sermon title was we you deserve to be happy but as we got went through the sermon you realize that's really not true we desire we are we don't deserve anything, right? We deserve death. Mm -hmm. We don't deserve to be happy. We deserve death because of our actions, because we did, but because of what Jesus did for us. He made us holy, and because we are holy, we can be happy. Remember, we took holiness, and we said it's over here, separated, he said that, and then we have to be happy. So we pursue the things of the world that think we're going to be happy, but really holiness leads us to true happiness. Because we act out of that holiness, right? God made you holy. So your attitude, the way we think, our, our, the way we, um, our emotions go, it all goes because we're happy because what Jesus did for us. Amen? He died on the cross for us. He, he bled and died. He, he redeemed us from the curse of death. And now we are happy because we have an attitude that I'm going to be happy because God did this for me. I'm going to be, maybe I should say it this way, maybe I'm going to be thankful for what God did. And that thankfulness, because what he did for us, makes me happy. I have joy when I give out of the wealth that God has given me and blessed me with. And I bless somebody else. I'm happy. And then he had said this which I thought was really amazing. He said, maybe God created us to be that way. As we walk in Him and we walk in His Spirit, all of a sudden things change in our lives. Our attitude definitely changes, right? I'm not worried about the things of the world anymore because I know God provides everything I need. Yes. Come on, say amen. You know that's true. If we trust Him and believe in Him, our attitude changes. But the enemy will say, no, you have to earn more, how about the money thing? You have to get more hours, more money, more wealth, and then you'll be happy. And that's a never endless cycle. Amen? Yes. I mean, even people with lots of wealth will say, I'm not at the end of getting wealth or a new home, a bigger house, or whatever they, things that they get because they have wealth, all of a sudden at the end you'll hear people saying, I'm not happy. Why? Because they didn't, they read the wrong script. True happiness only comes in a relationship with Jesus. We have to flip the script and believe that. Also, as the enemy attacks us over and over about what we need to do, you know, uh, well, I'll be happy if I get just one more degree. I'm happy if I get one a newer car. I'll get happy. All these things, right? And we find out it's not true. And the enemy will throw that at you to be on this little cycle over and over. But the Word of God tells us about something we have to hold captive. 
Let's turn to 2 Corinthians for a second. And we're going to be in a whole different book, but let's turn to 2 Corinthians for a minute. And I'll show you how important this verse is and how we're supposed to hold every thought captive to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Look at me when you get there, so I know you got, you got your, uh, on your iPhone you get to do a little bit faster, right? Yeah. I got a whole bunch, so. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Jesus over every situation. Amen? The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every petition that has set itself against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought that is made obedient to Christ. Now what does that mean? When the enemy throws thoughts at you that you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you're not holy, you're not this, you're that, right? He tries to change your identity into something else that you are not. You're supposed to, it says, this actually translates out to, to wrestle every thought. How many's get, how many's ever got bad thoughts in your head? Just me, or just ever, is it, come on, you know what I'm talking about. You get a thought that the enemy throws at you, and also, this word is telling us, Paul is telling us in the front here, that we should take that word that we hear and wrestle it down, overcome that, have victory over it, because Jesus overcame it. Not by yourself, but we have to act, right? We have to say, no, I'm taking that thought that the enemy throws in my head, I'm going to hold it captive, I'm going to throw it away, and I'm going to start believing what the Lord, the Lord says about me or about the situation. And we're going to hold every thought captive, lock it up, throw it away, wrestle it down, destroy it, because Jesus did it for us. Amen. And you can have victory over that situation. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's a relationship issue. Whatever it is, whatever the enemy throws at you, you have victory over it. And we're going to look at a, a man that, that struggled with some of these things. And I'm going to show you how the enemy attacks us in these thoughts and how we can have victory over them in three different ways. Amen. And I think we can, and today we're going to leave here that the understanding our identity and who we are in Christ, and that we can be victorious in every situation, even if the world falls around, apart around us. Even if things don't look good. Every, I, everything, I lost my job, I got this, the doctor said I have this problem, I could not get along with my wife or my, my, my husband, you know, whatever it is, the enemy wants to destroy you, but God has a different answer. And if we listen to the right script and we read it, then we know we can have victory over it in the name of Jesus. Can you yes. say amen? amen? God wants you to be joyful. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to walk in victory. God wants you to be free from the bondages of your past. God wants you to have victory day by day by day. So we're going to go look at somebody that struggled with this in, his, in the book of Job. Would you look turn to the book of Job with me? For you that are new at this, Job is in almost the center of the Bible. Maybe uh, if you get the Psalms, it's right before the Psalms. So if you hold, open your Bible, right to the center, and you go one left to the to uh, towards Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, and you'll find the book of Job. And we're going to be in the first chapter. We're going to read a few verses out of, the, out of this. We're going to talk about Job's life, how Job was this awesome person and had great wealth, and then he lost everything. And then some people try to help him, and then he trusted God at the end. He didn't trust all, we'll see this in a minute, okay? So look at this, um, chapter 1, 1 through 3, it says, in the, in the land of Oz there was a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and, five, and three daughters. And he owned 3,000 sheep, plus sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, what a title is that, right? You're the greatest man of all the East. Well, that, could you put that on a plaque, right? You put it on your door. 
right? And we like, this, he was great. He had favor with God. He feared God, right? He, and it said here that he didn't do any evil. So he read the script and he read that he did the right thing, right? And so he feared evil. But then all of a sudden there's a test came. The enemy, the devil, and his angels went up to God and said, hey, this guy, Job, that you think is so wonderful, you know, I, wanna, I don't think he'll serve you if I give him a test. And so we see what happens. It says, look at um, this, this test that he went through. It was kind of like God versus Satan moment here, right? Good and evil. It, it was a, a moment where, uh, and this is how the enemy comes to destroy your life. He'll bring to you some difficult circumstances that will test your belief in God. This is how he always works. Mm -hmm. Some are small things and some are large things. But let's look what happened to Job. Job had all these things, and we'll see in a moment here how he lost everything. Look at verse thir uh, 13. On one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The ox were, uh, were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the, the sea bees attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword and... And I am only, I'm the only one that is left. So somebody came and took all his donkeys, I mean his oxen, and, and he killed all his servants. Wow, that's a big loss. And then look what happened. <clears throat> well, excuse me. <clears throat> While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the, uh, the fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one that escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans came uh, from three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one that escaped to tell you. I mean, if you're a business owner and you lost all this wealth in that amount of time, what would you do? And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking at the oldest brother's house. And when suddenly a, a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one that escaped. What would you do if you lost everything? You lost your children. You lost your wealth. You lost everything. And just a, look at just a moments of time. Right? In this scripture, it's kind of interesting because it goes one right after another. While he was speaking, the next messenger came. When he came, the next messenger came. And he came, and that's how the enemy does it. One after another, he attacks you. You're this, you're that. You're not good enough. Amen? And the enemy will just do that over and over. Yes. You're not making enough money. You're not educated enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not this, you're not that. And all of a sudden, you lose everything. But look what, this is what is amazing about Job. Because remember, Job trusted God in the beginning, right? And God gave him all, he had all this wealth. I'm sure he praised God for it. I think Job was like a real thankful guy. Like, thank you, God, for all my camels. Thank you for all the servants that you allowed me to have to, to take care of my, my, my sheep and my camels and my dog. Thank you, God. I think God, he had just a really gratitude. He had an attitude of gratitude. Even in this moment, when he lost everything, look at what it says in verse 20. And this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head and then he fell to the ground. He fell to the ground. Why me, God? What is happening to me? No, he says this. He, he says this. Look what the word says. He fell to the ground and he worshipped God. I don't know what you're going through today. And everybody's going through stuff. This is a great example right here. God, the enemy took everything away, but he flipped the script and said, no, I'm going to worship the God that gave me And look what he says. This is quoting scripture too. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Ma, may the name of the Lord be praised in all of this. Job did not sin by uh, charging God um, in and he, he didn't do any wrongdoing. So look, he said, he praised God. The Lord gave and the Lord take away. My name shall be praised. God, he worshiped God. I don't know what you're going through today, but some of us are going through some stuff in this room, right? 
Nobody knows about it because we don't tell everybody our stuff anymore, and we're kind of we're kind of changing that a little bit in our missional community. In our missional community, we kind of share stuff with them, pray and encourage each other. I want to encourage you if you're not involved in a missional community, you know, you need to get involved, find out about that, and and we meet on Wednesday nights. We usually meet for dinner and talk, but you know, we need to share stuff, and we don't let the enemy uh, take that stuff, or we don't let the enemy continue to rule over you in those different areas of your life. As we're transparent, all of a sudden it's exposed, and then we pray for each other, encourage each other to walk in the way that, like Job did, hey, I'm going to praise God no matter what. And this is another way the enemy comes at us. The enemy will bring, will, will bring uh, somebody to come along us, uh, our side and start telling us, you know, hey, uh, Job, you know, maybe you should just curse God and die. That's interesting because this was his wife. So the one that was his partner in life came and was celebrating all the wonderful things that God did. And when all this was taken away, what happened? Somebody starts, says really close to you, starts doubting God. This is how the enemy attacks you. And it says here that Job got boils on his own on his body, on his head, and on his feet. And I highlighted that in my mind. I thought, do you ever get hit on the head? I mean, it's like painful, right? Ever bump your head? Well, I'll tell you from experience, it hurts. All right? And if you ever got, do you ever step on a nail or get a thorn in your foot or your toe? I mean, your, your feet and your head are real sensitive. He had boils on his head. He said he took a uh, piece of a stone and he actually scraped them. Yes. Could you imagine that scraping these things because it was so painful, right? He's scraping this. I mean, he's in just tremendous amount of pain. He was pathetic, if you will, just sitting there in just in this position of pain. And his wife comes along and says, Man, it's like, hey, Joe, why don't you just curse God and die? And I was, I was gonna look at that real quick. It says, uh, Two verse four. Good verse four. Chapter two, verse four. Oh, wait, verse seven. I'm sorry. So Satan went out and uh, from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from it, uh, on the soles of his feet and on his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped it himself with it, and he sat among the ashes. He's just sitting there, right? Can you imagine your husband and your wife just sitting in this heap of ash, just moaning and in pain and in his comfort, and his wife said to him, verse 9, are you still holding on to your integrity? I mean, are you going to still worship God after all this stuff that happened? I mean, you don't know where the bank account's empty. I, we don't have not, no, nothing left. I'm sick all the time. I'm going to the doctor, and, my, and some of us are on pain medicine over and over. You know, we just, we just, there's no hope. And the enemy takes somebody that's really close to you and said, Hey, why don't you just curse God and die? Are you still going to hang on to your beliefs? Do you believe really God's going to take care of you? Who's ever heard that before? Yeah. And he says, and he replied to her, Listen, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Does God bring good and trouble? Did you ever think about that? Well, I think of God as a sugar daddy, you know? Every time you want something, God's going to give it to you, right? But when the trials come, and when the testing comes that He provides to us, then we just want to run away and do our own thing. We only love to worship God when He gives us all the good things. Yes. What about the people on the East Coast? They lost, some of those people lost their homes, talked. Right, flooding on North Carolina, Georgia, all oh, is really crazy. Up in uh, Virginia last night, I was watching my two o'clock in the morning. I was watching Weather Channel. You know, I'm, I'm, I like weather and I like yeah. that kind of stuff, and I, I'm interested in it. Been through a few hurricanes and typhoons in my day, and so it's interesting how they 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 try to predict from weeks on in where these things go. They have no clue. I mean, they got doctorates and they got their you know two doctorates in weather, right? And they got all this radar and all this technology they have. They can tell you how fast it's going. They can tell you the strength of it. They can tell you the wind speed. They can't tell you where it's going because only God, the hand of God can do that. So God gives good and bad, right? In all this, Job did not, look at verse, the last part of verse 8, 10. In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. 
He trusted God. Things were really bad. Now, if you think that's bad, then all of a sudden the enemy does another strategy. He goes like, I'm, he's going to start doing demoralizing accusations. So he, his best friends come. They hang out with Job, right? They're like, Job, you know, God loves you. You know that, right? And it's kind of encouraging in the beginning, but also they say, Job, you must have did something wrong. There's got to be sin in your life for you to have all this stuff going on. It's how, how many of us kind of examine that? When things go rough, we kind of say, hey, maybe I did something wrong. God, is there anything wrong in my life? It revealed to me, God, if there's sin in my life or some unbelief in my life. Lord, help me to understand that what I'm going through is not caused by my disbelief or my sin. And God will show you that, right? God will show you if there's something wrong in your life. But Job didn't do anything. But his friends began accusing him, just like the enemy does. The enemy accuses you over and over that you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not wealthy enough, you're not educated enough, you're, you're, you're not none of these things. But you have to flip the script on the enemy. You have to say, no, 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 I believe in my Redeemer, I know who I am. I know I'm a child of God, amen? You have to understand that you've been forgiven. You've been loved. You've been taken care of. God, God's word says this. In those times when you feel God, you can't hear God, God said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. He is always there for you. Just call. Just say the word, Jesus. Man, God, this whole, my, everything is falling apart in my life. I don't know what to do. And then you have to, there's a, something inside you. There's some, something that says... Remember, God loves you. Remember, God saved you. Remember, God healed you. Remember, God set you free. And then all of a sudden, that faith begins to fill up inside you. You can shout or say the name Jesus. I remember being so sick, so in my deathbed, I felt like. Couldn't even talk. My throat was closed, and I was... People were mocking me. Oh, you're a Christian. You're, you're, you go Bible thumper. You, you. I remember holding my Bible, and I refused to go to the doctor. I said, No, Jesus, you have to show these people that you are God. I remember laying there, sweating, day two, three days, just sweating. And I probably should have been the doctor if somebody was in my right mind, but I wasn't in my right mind. I was just like holding on to the word, holding on to the script. You got to do that sometimes. When things go crazy in your life, you've got to hang on to Jesus, and he's going to set you free from that. You can't think, you can't lean to your own understanding. You can't lean to your own education. You can't lean to your friends and your loved ones. you got to trust God. Amen. And when you do, I remember that moment when the pain started leaving my throat. I began to start thinking. I just wanted all, at that moment, my throat was so swollen that I couldn't even speak. So I went, all I wanted to do was say Jesus. I had my Bible, I was reading it, I was, I, I was, I was in a bad place. I remember I could just say the name of Jesus, something would change. Mm -hmm. And it did. And it, uh, the tingling of uh, the healing began in my, my throat and I began to speak the name of Jesus. And as I spoke the name of Jesus over and over and over again. And then when my friends came in that were mocking me, I said louder, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And of course they made fun more. But it didn't matter because I knew I believed in. And that next day when I went into work and I was totally healed, I was a witness that God does heal. And I could have went to sick bed, I could have went to Walgreens and got some meds. No, I trusted Jesus. But I'm telling you, the enemy will tell you what you are. The enemy will tell you you're no good, you're unworthy. The enemy will actually, not only in that moment, the enemy will also just give you, say, that's not, you know, not only are you bad because of things you've done, but the enemy will, will tell you that's who you are. Yeah. Right? I did some bad, um, I stole things in my past, so now you're a stealer. I committed adultery, so I'm an adulterer. And the enemy will tell you that's who you are. You are never going to be anything different. And that's not true, folks. But him and all of a sudden, now, not only will you identify with that, but then that becomes your life story. Oh, I'm this because of what happened back here, and I'm still this today. I'm this horrible person because of what I did here, and years later, I'm still this horrible person because of what I did back there. You know, back there, God redeemed you. God set you free from that mistake, and he said, he's going to tell you, now you're an adopted child of God. Amen. You're a prince. You're a princess. 
in God's eyes. You don't want what the enemy is telling you to become your identity. Some of us in this room have done that. I am just this. And God looks at you in a totally different way. Your identity is that you're a, think about this, you're a brother or sister of Jesus. Because you've been adopted into this wonderful family of God. So the power and authority that Jesus had, you have also. Because of what he did for us. Amen? Amen. Let his story become your story. Amen? Don't accept what the enemy tells you. You have to flip the script on what God, on what the enemy is telling you that you are. Remember, you're adopted. You're, think about this. You're a masterpiece in God's eyes. Huh? You are chosen people. A royal priesthood. Amen? You are made holy through Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. You've been called. You've been set apart. You've been sanctified because of Jesus. Hallelujah. You've been redeemed. You are without blemish. Listen to this. You are without blemish or defect yes. because of Him. Yeah. Look, look, at, look, at my, look at all the things I've done. Look, we identify with all the bad things. But today, we're going to have victory over that. We're going to identify on who we really are. You are children of God. And God wants you to have victory. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. We need to read the script. Amen. Because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. Is he not? He went before God and accused Job of being somebody he wasn't. Right? And the persecution came again. The enemy comes and tells you that, that you're this or that. But listen, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. The Holy Spirit is our advocate. He's our encourager. Amen? When the enemy tells you you're this, the Holy Spirit's telling you, no, you're that. You're, you're a child of God. You've been forgiven of that. That's, that's your past. Matter of fact, that is never remembered by God again. God says your sins will never be remembered. They're as far as the east is from the west. So God will never bring it up. The only one that brings up your past is the enemy. Do you remember that? I mean, we need to probably study that a little bit more. But your past is over. Man, when I said yes to Jesus, and he baptized me, I was baptized into Jesus when I believed him. I was cleansed. I was, his blood came over me. My past was over. The only time that I think about my past is when the enemy accuses me over and over. Look, at you're not good enough. You're this, you're that. You can't be a preacher. You are special ed classes. You couldn't even speak when you were in middle school. And here I am standing before you today. God did that, not me. Amen. Amen. My marriage was messed up when we first began, right? But God came and intervened in my marriage. All of a sudden, our marriage, man, 38 years we're celebrating this month, right? God did that. We didn't do that. And Tina and I celebrate that all the time. We were just talking about that yesterday. How God has given us so much. We're so blessed. We say that, we were saying that, we, we're, saying, we're talking about what we have, not the things we have, but just what God's doing. And it's like, we're just blessed. I'm mean, after grateful, right? He said, well, you don't have this, and you don't have that. I don't need, all I need is God. All I want is His presence. Somebody asked me the other day, what do you want from God? Anybody ask you that question? What do you want from God? Yeah. Right? And we say things like, we say, well, I want this, or I want that. You know what I want? I want more people yeah. serving Jesus. Yeah. I want more people to be discipled into His kingdom. I want people excited about who Jesus is. That's all I want. Yeah. Amen. I remember uh, a few years ago, um, before this building is a unique building. It has its problems. And so I remember when I first came here, I said, God, I want a building. I want a building. I want a storefront. You know, because I did a couple storefront churches. We planted some churches. I just wanted a building so I didn't have to deal with all that stuff. Man, I, I said, I was downstairs a couple years ago. It was probably seven years ago already. And I was sucking up water with the shop back because was, the water drainage wasn't right. It's right now, thank God. But I was sucking up water, and I said, Lord, what am I doing? I'm sucking up water in this car, but what am I doing here, God? And, he, and there was nobody in the building, it was just me and God, and I'm sucking up water, and, and the Lord says, will you ask for a building? I don't know how he talks to you, but that's what he said to me. Remember when you were praying in Wilmington, North Carolina, behind the piano? You remember that day? Oh, yes, Lord. This is what you asked for. I said, yes, I did. And I said, I don't want a building no more. I said, God, this is what I said to God. I said, I said, God, can I change my prayer? I think God said yes. I mean, really, I really do. I think God said yes to me. I said, all I want now is souls for the kingdom, your kingdom. All I want to see people go from non-believers to believers, or believers grow in their faith. That's all I want, God. Nothing else. 
and we see what's happening today, and God's just moving in a mighty way. I flip the script on the enemy. I'm not going to believe the lies. Right? I believe God can do all these things. And the Holy Spirit is with you every day, encouraging you to read the script. Right? How do you flip the script? How do you change your mind? How do you battle that? You battle that by reading the Word and getting the Word of God. And all of a sudden, as you read the Word of God, all of a sudden, something changes. I start believing God. You get real quiet here now. I mean, listen, if I was a billionaire, right, or whatever, trillionaire, whatever, and I could give y'all a million dollars, and you'd like, y'all happy? It's not going to happen. <laughs> but if I tell you to read the Word of God and you'd be happy, nobody wants to do that. I want to do it. Well, good, let's do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's what, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we got to flip the script on what the enemy is constantly accusing you every day. Every day the enemy is constantly accusing you and telling you about your past. God wants to give you a different future. God wants to give you a different identity. Amen? God wants to set you free so you can worship Him like Job did, even though he lost everything. Yeah. He trusted God. Amen? He trusted God. Hallelujah. Chapter 6 in Job said this. Look at, let's turn it in Job chapter 6 and let's look at verse uh, 8. 6, 8. I got it read in my Bible because I have to underline it. You can do that on your phone too. You can highlight it. This is Job ready? He's ready. Job's ready to give up. He's ready. I don't know. I'm just ready. God, he says, Oh, that I might have my uh, request that God, that you would grant what I hope for, that God, you would be willing to crush me mm. and let loose and cut me. He said, God, just kill me right now because I don't want to waver. I know I trust you and I know I believe in you and I know that, but I don't. I'm getting to a point where I'm just about had it. Anybody been there? I can't, I'm just hanging on right now. I don't know what to do. It's, uh, the, the world's crushing down on me. I just, every situation is wrong. I, I, unbelief is starting to well up in my spirit. I don't want to be that. Job said, just take my life, God, right now. <laughs> and he started questioning God. And then God just turns this, flips the script on Job. As God only can. He says to Job, he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Were you there with me, Job? Like, were you standing next to me when I spoke in existence the world? I spoke in light, light happened. I put the stars in the heavens as an afterthought to all creation. Where were you, Job, when I made the mountains and the valleys and when I set the boundaries for the ocean? Where were you, Job, when I created all these things? You weren't there. Job just, Job says, my ears have heard of you, chapter 42 says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And every time you go through a tragedy, every time you go through heartache and pain and suffering, every time you know God, you hear, you, 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 uh, you read about Him, but then in that moment, God speaks to you. I remember being in a, in a, in a, in a place in, in a hospital and, and praying and God showed up and God healed the person, right? God showed up. It was desperate. There was no hope. I, I, I'm glad you said that about uh, Para. I believe I believe the same thing the other day. I believe God's going to raise Para up and that whole family is going to come to know Jesus, right? There's no hope. She's like, her whole body's shutting down. She has nothing left. The doctors don't know what else to do. And she's just hopeless for that family. They're Hindi, so they're praying and they're fasting and they're doing incense and they're doing all the stuff that they know what to do. But we know that Jesus can raise her from the dead and take, bring light to that body. God will show up in that moment. His presence is better than anything else in the world. When the finances are at the end and I'm, I don't know what to do and God, I got like five kids to feed. What, what, this check ain't going to make it. And Tina and I decided, well, let's give that last $35 in our check and account to church that day. Right? Because we can't buy groceries. There wasn't enough money to buy groceries, but I, I know God is my provider. So we, by faith, said, no, we're just going to give this, I think it was $25, $25 or $35. We wrote the check out of the church that day on Sunday. We put in an offering on Monday. We had a check for $150 in the bank. I'm not saying that's the way God, but that's God's way. Whatever. 
I trust him about everything. God will provide everything that you need. We just got to trust him. God will show up. His presence will show up. When I'm crying out to God, God, I can't do this. I remember praying in the office a couple years ago. I can't do this, God. I just can't. This is, I'm incapable of raising up a group of people to minister to the city of Madison. I can't do it. And God says, you're right, you can't do it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and he said, Christ is the only one that builds the church. So as we begin to preach, re-preach, if you will, about the gospel and what the true gospel is, about your responsibility as believers to make disciples and, and reach people in your community for the kingdom of God. As you come here on Sunday morning, be encouraged to do that. Amen? This is a ministry. This is just prophesying and encouraging to do the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is what you do outside of here. Read your Bible. Read the script. The enemy will tell you different. God shows up in the, His presence shows up is when you're most desperate. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. He's there all the time. And when Job said, that's it, then God showed up. How many need God to show up in your situation? Amen. How many need God? You need to flip the script on the enemy and say, no, I trust God. Let's turn this uh, one more. Uh, Job 19. This is what Job said. This is what I want you to, maybe you can highlight this in your Bible. Maybe you could write this on the tablets of your heart. Maybe you could put it on your refrigerator, put it on your mirror in your bathroom. I know that my Redeemer lives, that in Him and lives, and that in and the and, and that in and the end He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see Him with my own eyes. I and not another. God will show up in your situation and you'll be able to see Him. At the end, we're going to be called to be with Him. We've been saying that this morning in the song. But in your situation, God will show up. Only Jesus can do that for you. Amen? Only Jesus can make change your situation and make it... Man, I don't know where you're at, but if you're down and you're in trouble, if you have despair this morning, you're not even sure if you believe Jesus is real, I'm telling you, He is. And God wants to set you free from all the bondages and sin that you're dealing with today. Amen? I know today we're going to go downstairs and have a good meal. We're going to have some, uh, 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 we'll have, maybe need some help in the kitchen if you guys can help a little bit or whatever. But, you know, we're going to have a good time. But before we go downstairs, I would love to share with you or help you go from despair to encouragement to believing the truth about who God is. I will hang on no matter what happens in my life, to Jesus. I got one more story. Thank you, Lord. I remember when uh, Rajiv was going through a time where he didn't have a job. It was a whole year, right, Rajiv? A whole year. A whole year. Every, he, he exhausted everything that he could do to physically stay here in, in the United States and then Pay for his, uh, help, you know, provide for his family, everything from uh, getting money from overseas to just everything that he could do to, to make things right, he did. And when he came to the end, all he had was Jesus. All he had, and when he got to that point, and he cried upon the Lord, and God provided him this wonderful job he has now, and, and just, it's, it's just amazing how God restored all of that. Amen? And he was able to take a trip this year. I mean, God has blessed the uh, Rajiv even have so bad. A tremendous, the two wonderful boys. Just amazing. Because then at the end of that, he cried out to God. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're dealing with. I know the Holy Spirit's already in your heart, right? I know the Holy Spirit's already helping you. Like, this is what you need, right? Can we just allow the Holy Spirit to do that right now? Would you just bow your heads right now? And you can say, Pastor Bob, I need help right now from God.